Uh, we're in week two of, of this message series called The GOAT. And uh, if that's not an acronym that is familiar to you, uh, The GOAT stands for the greatest of all time. Uh, it's, uh, so I was a big 90s NBA fan, and so there's um, all kinds of GOAT debates. There's not really a debate, but... Um, so, so this is a common thing. Like if you're a sports fan, people like to talk about the goat, you know, Tom Brady just retired. He was the goat. And, uh, so that, that's a normal thing in sports. Uh, so the greatest of all time. And what we're doing in the series is we're looking at the, the biblical character that I would consider to be the greatest biblical character of all time, aside from Jesus, because Jesus wins all the competitions. So this is the human that is the greatest Bible character of all time. And, uh, and there's really, uh, there's one main place that that, uh, that, that, that idea, I guess, kind of comes from. And that is that the guy that we're talking about in this series, David, is described in a couple different places in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. Uh, he has the most screen time in the Bible. Uh, aside from Jesus, he has the most, uh, the most amount of the Bible dedicated to him and his story. And then he's described as this man after God's own heart, which is a a pretty awesome description. So, uh, so, so David has always fascinated me. I think his life is incredible. But crucially, the, the question that I'm really trying to wrestle with in this series is why is David described, what's different about him that he is described as a man after God's own heart and what can we learn from that? So uh, this series is a little bit different than what we normally do here. Uh, typically, uh, I'll, there'll, be some, some, um, there'll be some scripture, and then I, I normally do like a what do they need to know, a fill in the blank, and then a what do they need to do. I try to be very practical, very applicable. Uh, this series is different in that what I didn't want to do was walk through the scripture that we're going to walk through and tell you what I think you should learn from David's story. Uh, instead, what I want to do is create space for the Holy Spirit to speak to you as he sees fit based on where you are in your life. And so the message notes are different. Uh, we're covering a ton of scripture through this series. Um, and, uh, and then there's just blanks. And so what I want to do is I want to encourage you, I want to invite you more so, I want to invite you uh, to take a moment and, uh, and, and simply ask God to speak to you today. So I'm actually going to pray for us. I'm going to kind of pray this over you, over us. And then, uh, and then I would encourage you that, that if, if this is kind of a journey you want to go on with me, uh, I would encourage you to simply pray and ask God the same thing that I'm going to ask, which is that he would tune our hearts to hear his voice. Um, for some of you that are of a certain age, which I fall into this category, you remember when like with a radio, you had to tune it. You didn't just push a button, right? Like scan finds them all. You used to have to turn the dial, right? So... Uh, and if you weren't on the right, if you weren't in the exact right spot, you couldn't hear what it is that you were trying to hear. And so, uh, so I'm going to pray that God would tune our hearts, and I would invite you to pray that He would tune yours individually uh, to hear what it is that He has for you today. Deal. So let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Most of all today, thank you that you are active and that you are speaking, that you are working. And God, today I pray for every person in this room, whatever baggage, whatever stuff we walked in here with, um, I ask that you would help us in this moment to tune our hearts to your voice, to hear what it is that you have to say, that we might be more like Jesus. We love you. Amen. All right, so, uh, so last week uh, we started this, this, uh, this look at the story of David narratively. And so, uh, so we covered last week actually very little of David's life. Instead, what we did is we covered David's origin story. Like what led to this guy becoming such an important figure in the Bible? And uh, so we looked a lot at a guy's life by the name of Saul. Saul was the first king of the nation of Israel. I'm going to get everybody caught up real quick and on the same page. Uh, Saul was the first king in the history of the nation of Israel. Israel wanted a king like the nations around them, but God was their king. But they wanted a physical king they could look at and follow into battle. So they asked God for a king. God said, bad choice. Israel said, don't care. God said, okay, you're going to pay for it. There's the summary. Uh, so God, God anoints Saul king through a prophet named Samuel. And uh, what's crucially important, what's crucially important about kind of David's origin story is that what we see in Saul is we see a man who God calls because he kind of looks the part of a king. He seems like he should be a good king, but instead, Saul is overwhelmed and, and, and ends up making a lot of decisions based on fear of people. He's just, he's kind of, he's scared. He's kind of terrified. And we see it in a variety of different places through Saul's story. 
Eventually, that fear of what people are going to think of him leads Saul into doing things that are disobedient to what God has asked him to do. As a result of which, God goes to Saul again through the prophet Samuel and he says, hey, I've rejected your kingship. Like, you had the opportunity, had you been obedient, to establish a kingdom that would last, but instead you've been disobedient. So I'm going to remove my blessing from your, your family. I'm going to remove you as king. And instead, God says, I'm going to seek another who is a man after my own heart. Now, at the time, we don't know who this is. Shortly thereafter, uh, Samuel, God tells Samuel to go to this man's house in Bethlehem named Jesse. He says, you're going to find the new king there. So he goes to Jesse's house, and we're introduced to David. Uh, David is somewhat unceremoniously anointed king amidst his father and his seven brothers. There's eight of them all together. Uh, David is anointed king in a little ceremony. So nobody knows that this guy is the next king of the nation of Israel except for him and his brothers. And that's where we left the story off last week. We're going to pick up today immediately following that in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now, I've got a lot of Bible to cover today, so we're going to try to, we're going to, try to move, uh, but I'm going to try to give some commentary throughout. So again, here's what I would encourage you to do. If you have your message notes and you're a note taker, you're a writer, I would encourage you to grab those. And as I'm talking today, I'm going to read and then I'll kind of interject and give some commentary and things like that. And if there's anything at all that you feel like it just kind of sticks out to you, you feel like, huh, that's interesting, I didn't know that before, or just anything like that. If you feel any sort of interest in some particular things I say, jot it down. You never know when God's trying to give you something that you might need. So, 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting in verse 14. Now, the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Pause. Because for some of you, you're already like, well, that's a problem. So let me take just a moment. As a part of this series, I told you last week, I am, I am so passionate about helping people be able to approach the Bible, be able to understand the Bible and not get hung up on things that hang so many of us up with the Bible. And there's two big problems with this particular verse that might stick out to you. Number one, if you have a little bit of biblical knowledge, you know that there are sections of the Bible that talk about how God will never leave us, he'll never forsake us, he'll never abandon us. Unless you're Saul? That's a problem. Secondarily, the bigger problem that I, that I hear people talk about is this, if God's a good God, why does he do things like send an evil spirit to torment a guy? Because that's not very good, right? So here's the deal. If you're in either of those camps, I'm going to kind of address that today, but also mostly not. Because I could spend a whole series on those questions, okay? So we don't have time. I have time. You don't, I promise you don't have time. Here's what I, here's what I want to tell you. In situations like this, there is one thing that I think you should do that will help you significantly over the long haul. That is go to God with your questions. I'm sorry, two things. One is go to God. The most important is go to God with your questions and your concerns. Tell him about them. And then ask him one very important question. Will you show me what's really going on here? Will you show me what really matters here? Okay, so that's number one. Number two is talk to somebody who you trust spiritually that is ahead of you in the journey. Ideally, somebody who has a very solid biblical base and might be able to help you understand or see things that you don't know. Here's what I know. If you read the original Hebrew, it actually reads more along the lines of, and an evil, or, and, and a, and a, uh, it reads, God turned aside from Saul, almost as if he was looking at him like, all right, we're doing this. Saul's disobedient, and God's like, ah, I got to move on to a different plan, man. And then where it says, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him, the original Hebrew reads, and, and a spirit of sadness from Yahweh terrified him. That's a more literal translation. So what I think this is actually saying, this is the NIV translation. Again, this is, I could do a whole series on this. What I think it's saying is Saul got real depressed. Because like, wouldn't you, if you were king and then all of a sudden God said, I've rejected you and your entire family line and you're going to lose this. Instead, I've chosen another. I mean, that's not great news. Saul got depressed. 
So it doesn't use that language, but that's the image that the original text kind of puts forward. Maybe you think I'm reading between the lines a little bit too much there. Let me continue the narrative and see if it looks like somebody who's experiencing depression to you. So verse 15, Saul's attendant said to him, see an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. So let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. A lyre is like a harp. He will play when the evil spirit comes from the evil spirit from God comes from you and you'll feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find me someone who plays well. I like that. Find me someone who plays well. (laughs) If they stink, don't bring them to me. One of the servants answered, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. So Saul sends messengers to Jesse, and he says, Send me your son, David, who's with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey, loaded it with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son, David, to Saul. What are the chances that some dude in Saul's inner court would have been like, Oh, there's this guy, this shepherd in Bethlehem, uh, David. What are the chances? Let me tell you, zero. Those are the chances. No chances. This is very clearly God beginning to orchestrate and move pieces around to accomplish his purposes. Now, Saul has no idea. He has no clue that this guy is going to be his successor. Nobody knows outside of Jesse and his family. And yet here is God in a way that just seems so random and coincidental. But it's God orchestrating and moving. As a little bit of a side note, like this is the way God does stuff. Often in life, when you reflect and look back in the rearview mirror, can't you see how God moved pieces around that are like, how in the world did that happen? Well, God, he's, he's pretty good at it. He's pretty good at seeing the whole picture when we can't see anything at all. So as maybe an encouragement to you, if right now you feel like God's not doing anything in your life and you don't know what go- God's doing stuff, I promise and you'll be able to see it. So let's continue. So David came to Saul, and he entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, allow David to remain in my service, because I'm pleased with him. He's doing a good job. Let's give him a promotion. So whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul, again, remembering the ancient Hebrew here, says whenever the Spirit of sadness came on Saul, David would take up his harp, and he would play. They'd turn on music. Then Saul would feel better, and the sadness would leave him. Doesn't that kind of sound like somebody who's depressed? Now, is that, act, is that 100%? I, I, I don't know. Is that exactly? I don't know. The point is, I told you that because when there are sections of the Bible that you go, what? What, what is that? There is almost all, not almost, there is always more to the story than what you see at a cursory glance. The Bible was written in ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek, both of which are dead languages. There's always stuff going on under the surface that may not be obvious at a cursory glance. So when things like that come up and you're like, I don't understand this, this doesn't make sense, there is, there is always some sort of, there's something there that if you know or you understand can help it make sense. So the point is just keep digging. And that's why it's crucial to ask God, like, what's really happening here, okay? Now, let's continue because we got a lot to, we got a lot more to cover here. So so this is, this is the first moment of David and Saul meeting. And and the text kind of does a really abrupt turn right here. It's in this narrative about David and Saul, and then it just, it's like it stops and it begins a new story. And all of chapter 17 and the beginning part of chapter 18 is a story that if you grew up in church, if you had Sunday school classes, you know. David and Goliath. It is one of, if not the most famous story in the Bible, again, setting aside stories about Jesus because Jesus wins all the competitions. It is probably the most famous story, either that or the flood. One of the two of those is probably the most famous story in the Bible. And yet, (laughs) the story of David and Goliath, again, if you grew up in church, you probably learned this principle or this lesson from it. 
God slays giants. God can slay the giants in your life. God will slay the giants in your life if you trust him. That's a, that's a great principle. I think it's true. I don't think it's what the story is actually about at its core. And so what I want to do today is walk you through this narrative um, and try to help us see something a little bit different. Now, let me reiterate. That doesn't mean that the slaying giants thing isn't true. It's true. <laughs> but I don't think that's actually the main point. What people do sometimes with David and Goliath, that people, it's easy to do this, is they take this one story and lift it out of the context in which it sits. And then we lose meaning. If somebody wanted to take individual quotes of mine or individual stories that I tell, I'd be in all kinds of trouble. Because I, I say stuff sometimes that if you lift it from context, and you do this too, if the words you speak are, are, are lifted from the context in which you speak them, people can make the words we say say all kinds of different things, can't they? That doesn't always mean that what they're getting out of it is untrue, but it may not be the point. We do this all the time with the Bible. So let's keep in mind as we enter into this narrative of David and Goliath that what has happened to this point in David's story is mostly Saul. And the stories about Saul have painted a very clear picture of a man who is scared and who operates from a position of fear. As a result of that, God has rejected him with someone who is after his own heart. And it's in this narrative of David and Goliath that we begin to see why it is that David is identified this way and what sets him apart, what is, what is fundamentally different about David than everyone else. So let's take a look. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war, and they assembled at Soko in Judah. By the way, there's a lot of Hebrew words and names in here that I don't know, so I'm best guessing it. They pitched camp at Ephes, Demim, between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with a valley between them. So you got a picture in your mind. Israelites, Philistines, valley, or Philistines, Israelites, one of the great things. You can pick. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs were bronze. He wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So let's pause. Goliath was a big dude. The earliest texts actually say four shekels and a span. I mean, I'm sorry, four cubits and a span. You know what a cubit is? You know what a span is? Huh? Uh, some unit of money, I think. <laughs> I can tell you what a cubit and a span are. A cubit was measured from the tip of your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. A span was the tip of your uh, pinky finger to the tip of your thumb. So we got problems again. Whose arm are we using? I had a buddy in college who was a legitimate seven feet tall. If we're using that dude's arm versus my arms, we're getting wildly different measurements here. Okay? So, also, uh, the average height of an Israelite in, in 1000 BC was five foot to five foot three. Interesting. Here's the point. We don't know exactly how tall Goliath was, but he was big. Okay? He was big. The purpose, one of the problems that we have sometimes when we approach the biblical text is we want detail and accuracy. That's a very Western mindset. The biblical writers, if they were sitting in a room with us trying to debate like how tall exactly was Goliath, they'd be like, who cares? He was big. Like he was real big. He was way bigger than everybody else. That's... That's it. That matters. And here's why. The description here, when they list he was six cubits in a span, bronze helmet on his head, all this stuff, what they're doing is they're painting a picture of a man who inspired fear. A man who, if you looked at him, you're like, whoa, I don't mess with that dude. Like my buddy in, in, in college who was seven feet tall, 
He was seven feet tall, but he was about as big around as that microphone stand. I mean, he was skinny. There's also guys that are that big, like, so again, 90s basketball fan, like Shaquille O'Neal. If I saw that guy on the street, I'd be like, I'm not going to touch him because he will eat me for breakfast and lunch. You know, like, so the picture here is not just this is a big guy. It's like this is a big, strong, like he is someone that is going to inspire fear. That's the point. There was a reason to be afraid of this guy, not exactly how tall he was. And you see that as the narrative continues. They describe what Goliath does. So Goliath stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you line up? He, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man. Have him come down to me. Let's just mono e mono this. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I kill him, then you will become our subjects and you'll serve us. And then he said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. This guy's scary. The biblical writers use these themes. They write in themes. They don't write in detail how we think about it. They, they, write, they write in thematic kind of... Um, Thematic kind of movements almost. And so here we have this idea of fear. He's to be feared. He's someone to be feared. Well, what did Saul operate out of? Fear. So we have a king that operates from a position of fear, and we have a champion that inspires fear in everyone. Those ideas are deeply interconnected in this narrative. They're deeply interconnected. And then in the midst of it, we're reintroduced to David. And it's here that we begin to see, again, this entire narrative is differentiating David. It's saying, everybody's scared, everybody's scared, and then there's David. So continuing, verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward, Goliath. Goliath came forward every morning and evening, and he took his stand. In other words, every day he came out and taunted the Israelites. So now Jesse says to David, take this ephah, of roasted grain, grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and like, just go check on them. And then he says, take along these 10 cheeses to the commander. That's not, cheeses is not the, sorry. <laughs> it's not the right plural, is it? I'm not sure. Sometimes stuff just hits me. I apologize for that. <laughs> take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance. Like here's the dad saying, will you please go make sure your brothers are still alive? There with Saul and all the men in, the, in Israel of the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd. He loaded up and he set out just as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. So again, get this image in your mind. Two hills, the, 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 the two armies are now, it's early in the morning, they're drawing up their battle lines, as has happened every day, and we're about to see Goliath comes out. David comes right in the midst of all of this. So David left his things with the keeper of supplies. He ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Now watch again, here's the theme. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. See how like this theme just, it keeps coming back up. It keeps coming back up. Fear, 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 fear. And, and they all fled. That's going to be important in a little bit. Kind of file that in your mind. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He'll also give his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. That's a pretty sweet deal. You know what that is? That's a bribe from a coward. That's what that is. 
If you remember from the narrative early, if you were here last week, you know that I talked about the fact that that as Saul is introduced, he's introduced and they describe him in this really specific way. They say he was head and shoulders taller than everyone else. Saul was a big guy. So here we have big terrifying guy taunting Israel, big terrifying guy king going, uh, if somebody else will fight him, they can have my daughter and not pay taxes. That's what's happening here. Like, do you see that? This is a bribe from a coward. Who should have been the one to go fight the champion Goliath? The biggest guy in the army, which was Saul. Instead, he's bribing someone smaller than him with, frankly, a real good bribe. And the whole army knows about it. Fear. Fear. Fear fear. So David asked the men standing near him, what's going to be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, if you're not aware, as a quick aside, circumcision was the marker of being Israelite. So that's specifically what he's referring to here. Like those that are circumcised are God's chosen people. He's He doesn't have the mark. He doesn't wear the brand. Who is this guy? And if you notice, this is the first moment in this narrative that someone responds from a position that is not fear. It's the first time, but it is not the last. So they repeated to him what they had been saying. And they said, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. Now enter Eliab, David's oldest brother. So when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him. And he starts to insult him. He says, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? Like, you aren't even in charge of that many. Who would you leave them with? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You just came to watch the battle. Now remember, Eliab was passed over for the king, for being king. When God told Samuel he was going to anoint a new king, he said, a man after my own heart. What's different about David from Eliab? Well, Eliab's threatened by David. I mean, you don't bully someone unless you're threatened by him in some way, right? That's what Eliab's doing. (laughs) What possible need would there be for him to come and just insult his brother this way, except for he's threatened? Eliab knows David has been anointed the next king of Israel, I mean, I only have a younger sister. I don't have any brothers, but I imagine that if I had a little brother and he was a punk, and then all at once he was anointed king, I wouldn't like him very much. I'd probably be bitter. I'd probably feel like, why not me? But that's the point. God is looking for someone different than everyone else. Eliab's not different. Eliab is filled with fear, and he's filled with bitterness, and he's filled with jealousy. David, on the other hand, could have come right back at Eliab, right? But he doesn't. So Eliab insults him, and David just looks at him, and he says, what have I done? Not even going to let me talk? Then he just turns away, and he says the same thing to someone else. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard, and it was reported to Saul, so Saul sent for him. So David looks at Saul, and he says, let no one lose heart. In other words, let no one be afraid. Let no one be afraid on account of this Philistine. I'll go out and fight him. And Saul replies, and look, here it is again, fear. Saul says, you aren't able to go out against him and fight him. You're only a a young man, and he's been a warrior since he was a youth. Like, you're going to lose, man. This ain't going to work. Position of fear. Saul doubts David just like Eliab did. Where everyone else was bound up in fear and in doubt, David was not. And it comes out in the most uh, direct way in how David responds to the king. He looks at Saul and he says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it and I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. And then notice who David attributes his successes to. 
The Lord, who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David says, I've already gone to battle with things that should have killed me. And it wasn't my skill in battle. It wasn't my ability. It wasn't my strength that saved me. It was the Lord. And if the Lord is with me, then he'll be with me now. And this, this guy's not going to be any different. David doesn't think like anybody else. He just doesn't. And so Saul, after that response, goes, okay, God be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic, which is like a robe. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. And he says, I can't go out in these. They don't work. I'm not used to them. It's like you put on a brand new pair of tennis shoes, go run a marathon. That doesn't work. These things will be the thing that kill me because I can't even move. Then he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his sling in hand, he approached the Philistine. Saul says, you can't kill that guy. He's going to destroy you. David says, God's got it. Saul says, here's your armor. Well, what's the purpose of armor? It's your fail safe, right? It's your safety net in battle. It's the thing that will stop the things that kill you. David tries them on and goes, nah, that's not going to work. David declines his safety net. Who does that? Somebody who is either insane or somebody who has such deep faith and trust that he legitimately does not believe there's any chance that something bad's going to happen to him. Those are your options. So David goes out to Goliath. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. I love that they interjected that. And he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the, Philistine, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and I'll cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Do you see why, Abraham, why Eliab said he was conceited? <laughs> Cocky little punk. Like, that's what you would think hearing a guy talk like this, isn't it? But there's something really crucial in the way David says all this. He's not claiming any credit at all. At all. He's not saying, I know how to kill you. He's saying, you think I'm little? <laughs> You're nothing compared to my God. Do you see the difference? If David was out there saying, I've got this, well, yeah, that's cockiness. But that's not what he did. David said, everybody else around, all they see is how big you are compared to them, but I don't see that at all. I see how little you are compared to him. And there's such a fundamental difference in that. David almost looks at it like, well, you bring your weapons and I'll bring my God, and you're going to lose that war. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. I told you a moment ago to file that little detail about all of Israel fled every time Goliath talked. Here, Goliath taunts David, and David runs at him. That's not accidental that they included that. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it, and he struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine, and he killed him. It's a demonstration of the strength of God. With an uncommon weapon, 
without the safety net of his armor, this young man, probably a teenager, probably a very skinny teenager. Remember when Goliath said, you come at me with sticks? David was probably like 14, 15. I don't know a whole lot of 14 or 15 year olds that are like filled out. You know what I mean? Skinny, this skinny little punk just killed the champion of the Philistine army. When the Philistines saw, oh wait, sorry, I, I jumped. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine sword and he drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and they ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sha'arim, I don't know how to say that word, road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. A complete 180 degree turnaround. Why? Because they were led by a king who was motivated solely out of fear. A wicked king who was disobedient to God because he was so concerned with how everything would impact him. And now all of a sudden there's this, this hero who emerges. And he's not a hero because he was head and shoulders taller than everybody else or because he looked like a king. He was just a shepherd. He was a hero because in the midst of what should have been overwhelming fear, he said, well, God's got this. What is wrong with all you people? David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, who is that? Whose son is that? Abner replied, I don't know. The king said, find out. I love this interchange, it's a matter of fact. I want to know who that guy is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Listen, if you don't think the Bible's interesting, you're not reading the right one. <laughs> I, that's awesome. Like, Anyway. So he goes before Saul. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I'm the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan, who is Saul's son, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. That's where we end our story today. Now, I... I entered it by saying, you know, if you lift context out of stories, you can end up getting good points, but not the point. Here's what is happening in this story. The writer of 1 Samuel is very clearly showing this is what a bad king looks like. Someone who is consumed with fear. Someone who is worried about what everybody thinks of them. It, it, it's someone who is going to make decisions not based on what they should do, but based on what other people are going to think of what they do. That's not what a good king looks like. This guy, he's a good king. Now, before I finish up for the day, I do want to mention one thing quickly. And that is that if you've been paying very, very close attention, you might notice that what we read in chapter 16 seemingly is contradicted by several things that happen in 17 and 18. So if you go back and you read that last section of 16 closely, and then the account of, of David and Goliath in 17 and 18, there's some things that are hard to reconcile from a timeline perspective. I did like an hour and a half of research this week on that because it messed with me too. And here's why I tell you that. Not everything in the Bible just makes sense. It just doesn't. And sometimes you've got to dig. And sometimes when you have a Bible college degree and have been preaching for years, stuff doesn't make sense. It happens. Don't let it discourage you. I did a ton of research. I ended up finding a solution to it that I think works pretty well, but I'm not positive. 
But I'm going to repeat back to you what I said at the beginning. When you encounter stuff that you don't know what to do with, you go to God and you say, what's really happening here? What's really going on in this story? Because here's the deal. The, the timeline differences are about how David and Saul met. Does that matter when you're trying to show the difference between the good king and the bad king? D does it matter how exactly they met? No. There have been stories that I've told from this stage about my past that then, like, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave and, like, mom will call me and be like, um, that's not the way that went. Oh, okay. Didn't change the point of the story. Thank God not everybody holds me uh, accountable for 100% accuracy in every story that I tell. And thank God he doesn't do that for you either. We'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? So in situations like that, and by the way, again, I think I came up with a pretty good solution, but like in situations like that, ask, what's really happening here? What's the important thing here? What do I need to focus on here? And what do I need to kind of go like, I don't know how to make sense of that. Because here's what matters. God anointed Saul king. Saul lived his life from a place of fear and was disobedient to God because he was so concerned with what everybody else would think all the time. God rejected him as king and said, I'm gonna choose somebody after my own heart. Well, from the very beginning, I've said, what, what is it that's different about David? What's, what does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? And here's where we see the, the beginnings of it. It means that in a world where everybody is concerned about what everybody thinks and motivated by fear, that you stand with extraordinary faith because you know who God is. It, it means that, it means that, that, that when, when, when challenges and when storms and when fears and when giants come into our lives, we stare them down and we say, you come against me with a sword and a spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty which means you already lost. It doesn't matter what you have because I have something bigger. I have something greater. I have something stronger. So throw the best you have at me. I'll be all right. That's the point of David and Goliath. Yes, God slays giants, but God is looking for men and for women who stand in the face of what everyone else is terrified of and says, who do they think they are? What? My God is bigger. My God is stronger. My God has already won. Now, even then, things don't always go smoothly. Sometimes we have the impression that when we stand in faith, that God smooths the road in front of us. Fortunately, David's story tells us the opposite. But that's for next week. So, as you might imagine, I'll give you a very quick sneak peek. As you might imagine, David begins to experience a lot of fame because of what he did. Well, the king doesn't like that fame very much. And Saul turns on David and begins to make his life kind of miserable. So even in the best of moments, the road isn't always smooth, but we'll deal with that again next week. So today, I hope, that, uh, I, hope was, I hope this was helpful. I hope you learned some things. More than anything today, I hope you'll see that the God that we serve, the God that we believe in, the God that our faith is in, um, he's a God who calls us all to great things. But so often we derail ourselves because we're just afraid. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. But the story of David helps us see that God is faithful. He is a deliverer. And he wins. And I hope you'll have confidence in that. Let me pray for us today. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you that you are good. Thank you more than anything today that you are, um, that you are victorious. Thank you that we can have confidence and we can have assurance that no matter what we face, you were there before it, you will be here after it. You are bigger, you are stronger, you are more powerful. That the things that seem to us like mountains 
are like pebbles to you. That the, the things that seem like giants to us are nothing more than an ant to you. And so God, today for every one of us, I pray that you would help our faith increase. That in those areas of our lives where we are dominated and motivated by fear, where we are dominated and motivated by a, a position of um, of caring so deeply what others think or how things will reflect on us that we, we don't act or we, frankly, at times are disobedient to you. God, would you remind us of the battles you've already won in our favor, of the lions and of the bears that you've led us through. And then in the midst of a world that, stand, that stands so starkly against your truth. Would you give us the courage to stand and to say, my God has already won the battle. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.